Hey everybody, this is Brian Yellow, uh, number seven on the list, Origin Stories on Creativity. I had the pleasure of speaking with Paul Nabil Mathis. He's a musician, he's a writer, he's an artist. I have uh, his contact information down in the show notes on YouTube. Um, yep, that's the deal there, uh, as always. Eventually, BrianaYellow.com will be live later on this week. And... You could always follow me at B-R-Y-A-I-E-L-L-O on Twitter. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me. Right now, the best place to do that would be Frogger, like the game, F-R-O-G-G-E-R, 494 at gmail.com. Ask me anything you want. You want to be on the show, that's no problem. Let me know what you do. And uh, in the meantime, check out my writing. There's a bunch of stuff on Brian and Yellow Writes. Uh, destination right dot wordpress dot com all right here's uh Paul Nabil Mathis nice and rainy up here in New York you're in Los Angeles huh it is, but we actually got just a little bit of a sprinkle last night, which as far as we're concerned is a torrential downpour. No doubt. I bet yeah. people are driving like crazy too. Every time, man. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been in Los Angeles? Uh, I moved here in 2004, so a long oh, time, 13, 13 years, years. Yeah. And you're from Texas originally. Yeah, originally from Houston, and I moved, moved around a lot. Uh, you know, my... Uh, my you know have I have a Syrian mother and a Texan father, so uh, as 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 you know, which means that uh we I we just moved around a lot, not army, not anything, just kind of not army. So I I lived in the mil in uh in the Middle East for a couple of years when I was a teenager. Oh, that's so fascinating. Just, yeah, we lived in Syria for about you know four or five months, and then lived in Saudi Arabia for three years, Bahrain for one year. Wow. So. How does Tennessee, that... and then Florida, and then I ended up in California. <laughs> How old were you in the Middle East? That was 12 to 16. Interesting. That's fascinating. And were you already starting on that epic beard that you have at that point, or is that a new addition? <laughs> uh, I, um, I, grew the, I grew the very first uh, you know, ongoing facial hair when I moved back to America. Uh -huh. because everybody was like, oh, that's the guy from... He's got a mom with an accent because in Tennessee, they don't know. So, <laughs> so I actually had a goatee then and uh, I've had on and off facial hair for pretty much ever. The yeah, beard, that's pretty though, epic, my friend. The beard, I think, is a couple of years old now. Uh, okay. I, I just I started working from home and then I was just like, oh, why would I shave? Screw it. What do you do from home? IT stuff, customer support. Oh, fixing oh I got gotcha. you. All day. It's boring. That's frustrating. It's fine. <laughs> you know, working from home is great. Working from home is great. And it gives you an opportunity to work on your fiction. Yeah, I mean, especially in Los Angeles, not having to walk or uh, not having to drive to work is a is a big, it saves you on your kind of your daily amount of brain power. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's definitely a little like far less stressful. It's cheaper. Um, and you know, you can basically clock out and just immediately go to the book or something, you know? So, mm -hmm. but that's not all you do though. You're also a musician. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, yeah. I've been writing I, I gotta say music. you have to check out your YouTube channel because it's, it's, I checked out your YouTube channel. It's wonderful. <laughs> that that Scottish piece that you said your brother loves, man, I love it too. That's just really a beautiful piece of music. Oh yeah, yeah. That was that was a funny, funny thing to come around. That 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 song has a lot of history for me personally. <laughs> what kind of history? So, so uh, I've been writing and doing music for pretty much forever. Um, mm -hmm. I wrote my first novel attempt, novel attempt <laughs> when I was in like fourth grade and I had like all okay. my student student peers read it and stuff but like uh you know the the music thing has been the main focus because I really think that music takes you know it takes more just study time you know yeah there's a lot there's a lot of repertoire there that and it takes like real constant study from for me personally at least some people can just do it but uh, so I know are you uh are you just a vocalist or do you play instruments also 
I'm like one of those guys, like I'm mostly a vocalist and a composer. Um, mm-hmm. And I, that my degree is in music composition. Oh, I can wow. kind of, if you give me an hour, I can probably plunk out some stuff in a recording on any instrument and like people will think I'm good at it, but it's, <laughs> it's all wonderful. a lie. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I've played in, I've played in a couple of bands. I've done, I've done bass and drums and. I'm a bit jealous of all of that. My God, I can't play an instrument the same way. Like, I can bang on things and then get yelled at. That's basically Amen. how my life with music is going. Hey man, if you go to like a high enough to your grad school, they'll just call that music and like oh, really? <laughs> be like impressed by your raw passion. How Who far needs... did you get? Did you uh, get a uh, graduate degree or did you just stick with the yeah? The BFA? I have a, a it's it was it was a it's kind of like it's a single major, but it was like a double focus and mostly composition and vocal performance at California Institute of the Arts. Oh okay, that's a good school. My master's of fine arts there. And when you're pursuing music, are you considering, I mean, you have a pretty deep fantasy roots in your, in your authoring. I mean, you're writing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it's been, uh, it's been mostly fantasy my whole life. Um, pretty Including much. with the music. Yeah. And so I, one of the, the reason I ended up going to grad school is I actually had written, I, I wrote a book that was terrible. And then I wrote another book <laughs> that was only a slightly less terrible and then I wrote a musical that was pretty okay and so and the, and the musical was um it was kind of magic realism but there was definitely uh-huh. it, it was it, I think I think if you wrote a novel based on it they'd probably call it urban fantasy of some kind mm-hmm. um and so uh it, it's it's just kind of always been there there's always a little bit of magic but this is the my first epic fantasy attempt mm-hmm. um and it's called orc song called Orc Song. Yeah, Beautiful it's about, it's really, about really a half. Good name. <laughs> Thank you. It's funny because everyone always says, you know, because I'm trying to get it traditionally published. I, I start querying yeah, next, <laughs> next week, actually. So it's just like, uh, everyone always says, you don't you don't get to choose your book's name. And I'm like, I don't know. I really like my name. It's, no, you really do like your name. I like your name. I, <laughs> I don't know I about you, but I like your name. That's <laughs> actually, I mean, um, we share the same subreddit on on reddit basically i guess that's redundant but that's where i discovered you and you know your your title really sticks out so if it's if you get stuck with a traditional publisher and they want to change your title i would run yeah to find a different publisher <laughs> <laughs> exactly it's a it's actually i need to shout out my, my brother and i are really close and uh mm-hmm. he's way better at names than i am so whenever i need to name stuff i just usually call him up or sit down with him if we're in the same city and, and start trying to get him to come up with names for me so he actually read my book and then called it uh something similar and then i kind of started building like now now actually all music in the world is is called based after the race so if it's like a traditionally dwarf song it's called dwarf song like dwarf song one word so that's where the the, the title comes from i love me some dwarves i imagine that is a uh, very drum heavy music right exactly it's 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 actually funny like uh i i try to have fun with it because i mean it is i mean it's a totally original setting and uh, you know i do weird spelling so orc is with a k and dwarf is with a u instead of a w and things like that Mm -hmm. it's like traditional like like archaic spellings and Mm -hmm. the i have fun with it because i like the uh the main characters a lot of their music is actually like based on the blues like it's like folk folk blues music like if you actually dwarf like, music is no like orc music like main music. Oh, orc music dwarf music interesting dwarf music is there's different cultures but one of them is c the c dwarves are actually they're really big drum having like a galleon drum oh that's fascinating and then you've I've got recently and, started to explore yeah. sea faring dwarves mm-hmm. in a couple of pieces of short fiction oh man it's great it's great it's <laughs> it is awesome words. actually I, I don't know why but it just makes sense like this it does huge iron <laughs> you know, the ship carrier. It's all, it's great. <laughs> I just picture this old weathered dwarf behind the wheel, you know, they're being followed by pirates. I've done this like twice already. Dude. It's just a really great way to yeah. <laughs> use the race. Super stocky beaten dwarf with like a, <laughs> like a Joffrey Rush hat, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's perfect. I love it. And the orcs are blues. Well, yeah, I, I mix it around, but I just, I wanted to, because every, <clears throat> I'm sure some, people will hate this but i mean every chapter in my book ends with a song excerpt um excerpt and so uh, i tried to be really kind of unique i didn't want to get all tolkien about it you know about songs because that's what everybody associates it with so i take a lot of uh folk and inf- it's all different types of folk music but it's all cultural so the half works in particular are kind of bluesy but then the dwarves there's you know you have 
the, sh the pirate shanty ones, and then you have the uh, the more traditional, like kind of Gaelic ones, and then I have like a tree race, and they're all kind of based off of uh, uh, it was a uh, Navajo um, ch chants and stuff that they do, and I just kind of I just kind of match people up with different type of folk traditions. And yeah, I just so happen, uh... yeah, I like blues, so the the half breeds like blues too. That's that's um, that's how it does. I love blues too. I like jazz. I just discovered. I know they're told you different types of music, but not really. Um, they're really. Yeah, I I love how they just kind of. It's an argument between instruments, basically, or mm -hmm. conversation. Yeah, um, and that's kind of how I how I landed on that because it's you know it's the the whole theme of the of the book is people who are kind of stuck between places. So I think mm -hmm. blues is a kind of perfect representation of that. And it's got a great fantasy background too, with Robert Johnson on the crossroads. Right. And, you know, yeah, exactly. it's got the whole outcast of uh, civilization or society or whatnot being against the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know. You got your, <laughs> <laughs> how you want to take this. And in terms of uh, race, I mean, you've got that race being on the outside and everybody kind of being interested, but at the same time, if they, they show interest, they're outcasted from it. It's right. Great. Exactly. I mean, and you... if you think about it, like how did like when when black people were really still quite marginalized, I mean, they were they were still able to get a, a fair amount of success, you know, viewed at viewed as that by white people, by white people. their music. Like, mm -hmm. you know, they're, you know, white, white people are the ones that own the radio stations. I mean, you well, yeah. play. So, <laughs> so, they, so if they were good enough at music, basically, and they could play the game, then they would, you know, they could lead out, you know, still, you know, a highly you know, prejudiced and bigoted life, but at least kind of gain some kind of like invisible man style success. So it's all kind of things that are going to bounce in my head because I try to focus a lot on the music, even though it's a book, you know? That's interesting. I mean, you even bring up uh, the invisible man aspect of it and right away, Elvis Presley comes to mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, it's, I, I'm not calling anyone in my book Elvis, but you know, it would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> are you um I, we'll talk a little bit more about your your current work i mean the one that you're going to be curing uh are querying are you um you say uh, your title's orc song so mm -hmm. are you i mean are you uh centering your characteristics on like a bard type who's your character <laughs> i guess is what my question <laughs> is no yeah exactly it's a lot of people ask that so kind of I, and this there, there's a lot of just personal like trying to out like kind of name when I really was like starting to build the world and I, I was trying to name all the tropes I could think of and flip them on their head so because that's you know I wanted traditional races but they wanted like the elves in the story are the bad guys like things like that mm -hmm. elves always should be the bad guys yeah and, and <laughs> the the their type of magic uh is you know, there's different words for all of it, but their type of magic is based on music and sound. So their strongest mages basically are, are the bards because it takes a really long time to reach that title. And once you do, you kind of master sound and music. So I'm sorry, you said the orcs were their most powerful music is or the powerful magic is based on music, right? Uh, well, the elves. So uh, each of the races kind of have their own racial magic. Um, and it's based on an element. It's, a, it's elementalism. Mm -hmm. um, but kind of the, if you can become a bard in your race, it's kind of beyond race. You're like a, an extra, like an, a, an, an extra tier above that's not really racial specific. So it's kind of like if you can become a bard, then you kind of get so good at it that you don't have to be just with your element. You can kind of just do kind of magic, like vibrational magic. So um that's, that's the, really interesting yeah and so you know and, and just it's basically like they talk a lot about you know everything has its song and the world began with the song which is very tolkien-esque and you know so the orc song is kind of just like the orcs are marginalized this is a world that thinks orcs are extinct there was a genocide 200 years ago and so these <laughs> orcs are all in hiding and um so this is kind of like the orcs never got their song because they were wiped from the face of the planet and then they kind of reemerge and now they the orcs get their song again. That's fascinating and you've got 140,000 words written on this uh <laughs> yeah it's it's pushing the limit of what's allowed <laughs> but that um... could be broken down into three different novels. I mean that's three <laughs> publications right there. I don't know does it work like do you think you could break it down into separate novels? Um well yeah, it's actually it's actually a novel in three parts that are you know not exactly, you know, they don't, they don't exactly go like, you know, 50, 40, 40 or whatever, but they, uh, they, 
it, it is a three-part novel, an epic novel. So it's, and I, I'm always thinking about ways to cut it down or, or split it up if I needed to. It could certainly be done. Um, so you are, <clears throat> you're, you're still working on it or do you all, you're just going to say I'm done and this is it. I'm going to query this thing. I'm going to get it published and I'm working <laughs> on my next project. Uh, I'm not yet working on book two. I'm a kind of a notorious tinkerer and, uh -huh. um, but most of the beta readers are back. Most of their feedback has been applied. Um, and, uh, I am experiencing extreme manuscript exhaustion after mm -hmm. two and a half years. So, two and uh, half years. Yeah, I, what, I'll, what I'm honestly what I'm going to do probably is take a break from writing to record some of the songs from the book, and and then and then probably I'll in a couple of months or so I'll go back I'll go back and start book two. That's fantastic. So you you're in a band. Uh, yeah. Well, isn't everybody? Uh, we say I'm that. <laughs> we say that in LA. It's it's not accurate at all. No. <laughs> but um, yeah, I I I, I have a band. Uh, we we haven't. You know, we were we were more active kind of before I started writing on this book. But I have a band, I have a YouTube channel, I have a lot of collaborators from grad school that I'm still very good friends with. So, um, you know, but the yeah, but the band is called Mad Apple, and um, and yeah, where do we just do? I just I'm the lead singer. I write all the songs. We do psych. You got like, you got a great voice too. It it's, <laughs> was really enjoyable listening to the piece of music that I found. Um, and I made uh, I put that down in the notes. Where they can find your YouTube channel. Um, <clears throat> do you how, how do you think uh, your Syrian roots have come into play with the development of your world? Yeah, I, I very directly. I you know, so it's weird, right? So right now, I think a lot of people in fantasy are trying to embrace um, you know non Eurocentric culture inspirations. Um, can you give examples? Yeah. So, for example, you've got uh, Yoon Ha Lee. You've got the, uh, you know, and, and what's the the three body problem? Uh -huh. I, was, I thought yeah. that who the author was. Yeah, that's a great book. Well, Yoon Ha Lee didn't write that one, but Yoon Ha Lee does short stories. I, I I'm sad. Unfortunately, I can't remember uh, the author of the three body problem. Um, but it's like, uh, and then there's Nanetti Okorafor, and oh yeah, Liu Liu Sichin. Liu's, I don't know how to pronounce that name exactly, but Liu Sichin is the three body problem. And then Nanetti Okorafor and N.K. Jemison are both um, um, female, uh, you know, women P POC writers, and they tend to write, um, you know, uh, African or black diaspora. And then, uh, you know, it's just things like that are, are becoming more and more common and, and definitely sought after, um, I think. Um, but the, the problem for me is, is that, well, there, there aren't a whole lot that are Arab based. And even then it's like, um, I'm not a hundred percent Arab. I grew up in America. Obviously you're talking to me. I'm, I sound a hundred percent culturally American. Uh, so, so even if I were to find one, it still wouldn't feel right because I identify as this person who is in between, you know? And so the, so I, when doing languages, for example, like I am developing like an alphabet and, and a really crappy conlang sort of a thing for it because I'm a nerd. But, and, but it's like, you know, it's, it's the alphabet is based on the Arabic alphabet, which I can read. And um, a lot of the words are, are translated from or like, you know, bastardized versions of, um, of, Arabic, of the Arabic language and that kind of a thing. So I'm trying to give it kind of that flavor all the way through. And then, of course, uh, on more directly, um, I'm Syrian, which obviously is a place of extreme political strife right now. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is the uh, this this is the first book of a trilogy, uh, planned trilogy. And the book, no, not to give too much away, but it it it's going to deal very strongly with the concept of refugees, um, which is kind of like the big one, like personally for me in terms of the, the Syrian situation right now. So it's, 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 it's a lot of vagueness. It's not really on the nose. Like I think a lot of those other novels I mentioned are, <clears throat> but it, in, in a lot of vague ways, I think it's very personal. And in some ways it's, it's actually um, very deliberate and direct with the Syrian influences. No, it's incredibly interesting. Um, there's different ways you could take the Syrian problem too, because it's a primarily a, a Muslim country, but yeah. the Christian sect in that country has just been uh, devastated by by the war, like first <laughs> and foremost, right? 
Yeah, my my uh my family is interesting. I my uh, my grandfather was like this atheist poet in Syria and like had all mm. these like, you know, and if you talk to a Syrian and say my mom's family name, they would recognize it. It's a big family. And um it's like and and then he, but he was like, you know, atheist anarchist poet and then my mom's mom was Protestant Christian. So, uh, I don't have any um history of of Islam in my in my like family history so and then when i hung out there with our family like kind of you know well before the war had Anything started happened, yeah yeah it's like religion is definitely present there but it's it's so much more of just like like it, it was it was not the same as like what you would see if you went to like saudi arabia even or something that was which like, you did so you mean yeah. you could compare the both of them right exactly with saudi is <laughs> like a theocracy syria is kind of like a you know just like a dictatorship so as long as you love- don't not a voice of dissent you'll be you can lead out a very happy normal life i would love to go unfortunately i'm just uh i'm bogged down by fear <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah we haven't been back in in some time either um such beautiful i mean there is a lot of beauty in that area of the world that just shut off completely to me it feels uh, like it's so much history it's it's incredible like you just take for granted i think um, what it's like to be around things that are just thousands and thousands of years old you know and uh, you know the it, there's the the city that's like really got bombarded is Aleppo, which is like it's dominated by this this giant castle <laughs> up on a hill in the middle of the city. Uh, you know the the crack de Chevalier. So it's like it's it's just and you know the, this market is you know centuries old and this little stone in this wall is like predates Jesus and that you know that kind of a thing. That it's just it's just an ancient ancient area and it's one of the it's kind of one of the birthplaces of like language and and civilizations for sure, like Assyria and that kind of history. So it's just there's nothing like it. And I went there for the first time when I was nine years old, and so it's it's in, and I went back several times. And obviously, we visit there a lot when we were living in the Middle East. So it's just kind of like this profound sadness that you have when you think about no matter no matter what, like Syria will pull through it, but things will have been lost, and that is just kind of. Um, a big part of kind of like the sadness in my book. My book is not a, like a melancholic book, but a lot of really sad things happen and some things very much irrevocably. So uh, I, I was definitely thinking along those terms, like if I was going to destroy this city, I'm like, yeah, just like they destroyed Palmyra, you know, that kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. I know it sounds really dark, but I mean, you know, it's, it's just, well, it is mean, what it is. You have to, you write within to... the, uh, you yeah. write within what you know. I mean, and it definitely sounds like uh, you've been affected by the horribleness that's happening over there. Um, oh, it's hard to get away from it. And it's interesting that you're, you're actually embracing it a little bit with uh, your orcs being, I mean, you say refugees. So let's, let's discuss that for a second in terms sure. of uh, where these characters are. They, they've been erased supposedly from the world in which you're writing. They don't yeah. want, no longer exist. So they come up from hiding basically. Right, exactly. So in this in this world, you know, there's kind of def- several layers of secrets, but essentially a very big part of their magic is uh, this this special mineral that's becoming scarce. Um, you know, so imagine, you know, just like us, you know, the oil was was actually running out. There were no shale re- refineries or whatever, and so like you know, our whole way of life that like gives us power is going away. And this the city uses that basically is this kind of special mineral to kind of create a magical barrier around their mountain to so that the rest of the world can't reach them doesn't know what's there hasn't ever been there in like 200 years doesn't realize that there's these ancestors of orcs with you know tusks and green skin and stuff that are living there so it's to me it's kind of like when i was a, when i was a kid uh you know if i said i was from syria to people from texas you know they would have no idea what country that was they had never heard of it and mm-hmm. they, you know, they would make fun of me and all that kind of a thing, you know, it's just whatever. But, you know, it's, it's, it's relevant in my life that the, the moment where Westerners kind of started to, to know what that meant when I said I was from Syria was at the same time that the Gulf War happened. So it's like, like this really strange, like parallel I have with, uh, you know, people started to know, like kind of know, like, Basically, the country to them didn't start existing until a war broke out. So it's like it's the same situation here where because this this mineral is so important to the entire world and not just these these half works, 
you know, their, their special barrier is, is breaking down because they're out of this mineral. But that also means the world can see them now. And the whole world is ready to have a war anyway because it's like just like an oil war. And then on top of that, like, oh, sh- holy crap, there's orcs all of a sudden. Now we really need a war, you know? So it's mm-hmm. like all the, and, and so they're, these people are just trying to live out their lives just like anybody else. But everything the rest of the world can see is these are these horrible creatures <laughs> who, who, you know, caused so much bloodshed in the ancient wars. And now we need to kill them again and that kind of a thing. So, you know, it's, 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 if you can imagine being a refugee and just how hopeless that situation might seem, like imagine you were like that, but you know we're green and had tusks. <laughs> well, I, I I feel the uh, the unfairness of it. I mean, basically you're living your life. You've got something that the whole world wants. You're uprooted and sent someplace else. Exactly. Or That's killed, or murdered, point. or considered yeah. like a, a subspecies because you uh, you're sitting on top of something that that was deemed valuable. Exactly, and the whole point is, you know, it's 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 not you're not a sub a sub race just because you have tusks and i it's actually interesting it kind of it kind of rewires my brain at least writing it because now whenever i read a fantasy story and it just has generic evil orcs i'm like Ugh, that's racist <laughs> <laughs> no it's nice that you've i mean obviously i've, I've talked to a, a few writers um in this project this podcast project which is just youtube videos right now because i cannot figure out how to get it to become a a podcast so technically illiterate (laughs) but (laughs) i'm working on it friday i tried really hard and just gave up it's like oh this is impossible but anyway i I talked to a few writers who really spent a lot of their of their we'll call it career building a world in which they wanted the function characters um and it, it definitely sounds like what you've built here is a world and i'm curious did you build the world or did you build the characters first i'm discovery uh i tried really really hard to outline and i suck at it like honestly i write the book and then i write an outline of what i wrote and then see where the plot holes are <laughs> yeah i'm the same um, way and it, and it takes longer for sure it's a very grueling process um i'm character based i think most authors no matter who you talk to will uh, will say they're character based like even brandon sanderson who's clearly he builds the world kind of first but i just started I mean, his book the what's it called the one that's uh, everybody's talking about right now uh Oathbringer or it's the, the, um, the, the no the, it's uh the way of the kings actually way of, yeah the stormlight stormlight archives right the that's the name of the series I, uh, oh it is <laughs> Hopefully I'm reading the first book because uh No no you are, yeah, that's perfect. It's the it's the first book in the Stormlight Archive, The Way of Kings. Uh, it's finished um, too, isn't it? Because no, I got set Stormlight up by Archive. Patrick. Oh, it's still ongoing. Uh, I do not believe it is finished. Oh man. <laughs> I read uh, um The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rufus. Such yeah, a yeah. Odd, oddly meandering story, but so captivating. And I just wanted that character more. And now I'm desperate for a third book, even though he drove me crazy. It's like, come on, man. It's like yeah, eight books here. Yeah, he's a long writer for sure. Discovery, again, that kind of a thing. Um, but it's mm-hmm. it described to me, uh, actually, uh, so yeah, if any, any writers who are listening, Brandon Sanderson, you can search. It's like, it's something like writing with dragons or something, but he has like a, a couple of lectures, an entire semesters of lectures um, on, on YouTube that are, I found really helpful when I was kind of trying to learn how to write a book. And one of the things that he talks about a lot, because he's an outliner, is kind of the differences between the two authors. And the kind of, everyone has their kind of like, well, this is why this is better, and this is why this is not as good, and that kind of thing. And like, I think I think if you're a true gardener um, slash discovery writer, the, the characters are, are going to be your driving force. And the reason is when you're trying to really be true to your characters, they will describe they will they will tell you what was happening in the plot and for me the plot built the world that was like that was like uh the, like you know down the line i was like okay well i need to kind of rehash this over and over and over again because these are the characters i want to tell and how can their magic be important to the plot you know so it was kind of like that where it's just kind of like my entire first draft if you read it now would be like well this is a totally different magic system but you know i kind of just worked at it and worked at it around the characters that I had learned to to love 
before I had like a world and a setting and a plot. And that's why I had to rewrite so many times <laughs> is because of that process. But the so characters, characters plus the plot equals the world or actually plus plus the world equals a story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. Characters first, then then setting and then your your plot will happen naturally if those things are strong and consistent for me personally. No, I think that's great. Um, I mean, uh, I'm the same way in terms of uh, I have an idea. I have somebody I want to describe and I put them in a world and I have to make the world realistic. So I, I look up reasons for the world to exist and then float from there. Um, exactly. I couldn't imagine sitting there and not writing the details as I'm going along, just doing an outline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm lost weird. right now in my novel because I have no clue what's actually happening. Oh yeah. Well, so, so an outline is, is a really great tool. Um, mm -hmm. and I, and I did start with one, I tried to write one, but I deviated from it really fast. Um, and so rather than kind of, you know, so, but I didn't try to like, you know, change my, my, my writing to fit the outline. As soon as it, the outline didn't make sense anymore, I just went off in my own direction. But when I finish a draft, I always make an outline of it um, and look at it kind of on a couple of pages and then try and really, and, and that's, that's where I really start to get my plot down. That's a really thing, interesting idea too. I've never considered after finishing a draft going, okay, what did I just write? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, 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 it was really helpful. You know, no, and, and my, my girlfriend was one who represented that or who recommended that to me actually. And she's been like a really important part of this process for me. And she writes as well um, kind oh, good. Of for herself, but you know, she's, she's a good writer for sure. And um you know that that was that was one of the many things she suggested, and I found that to be particularly helpful. Oh, that's um, fascinating. Um, what does she write? Uh, <laughs> she would get mad at me if I if I mentioned that. But no, it's like she like she writes for herself. I think she she she's mostly a visual artist actually. But mm -hmm. it's it she's a she's an incredible visual artist, and she's actually helping me out a lot with both character design, like she's, she helped a lot with kind of the specifics of what each of the races look like. And she's working on some maps right now that I am just super excited about. Like she, like she's, she's been reading, she reads way more books than I ever could. I'm a slow reader, but she, uh, she wrote, she drew a lot of fantasy maps, I think when she was growing up just for fun. So mm -hmm. this, and this map she's working on of my my major city where most of the things take place is like it looks really cool. I cannot wait to <laughs> post it online and and reap all the Reddit karma. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> That's hilarious. It's really interesting to consider that um, as an artist, it it works to have a polar opposite as your partner. I mean, I have yeah. a really good friend who's a poet, you know, and if I was with that person, my life would be hell. But because I'm married to this really logical thinking math genius, I'm able to function better. You know what I mean? I can't be with a another artist, really, honestly. No. So, uh, so what? What's her name? Uh, uh, I'm blanking on her name. She's like a really famous performance artist. Starts with an M. Uh, I can't think of it. She. Marina Abramovich, that's the name. Marina Abramovich oh, okay. uh, has like this very famous uh, re artistic relationship with another performance artist um, that, that ended really sadly and tragically. Um, and, and when it was done, she was kind of, she had this quote that says, I have one thing to say to artists, never date an artist. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, that was always kind of, uh, it's like impossible because if you're in the art world at all, it's like, it's all you know. And uh but it, it turns out for me it's like i understand what she was saying because you know you're an artist has this just necessarily has to be very focused and to some extent on yourself and like kind of connecting yourself to the outside world i think is how you become a good artist but in, i agree in this case um because we're not competing in any way like she you know she's 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 really like she's a filmmaker and a visual artist and I'm like a musician and a, and a like fantasy novelist. So even though like we can really understand each other's like workflow and we can kind of get by in each other's field, like we're not really competing for that professionally in any way. So it actually uh, ends up being really, um, um, uh, you know, we, we looking for the word lucky, that, honestly, right? I mean, <laughs> it could have gone either lucky way. Works. <laughs> lucky works. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you could have ended up with somebody just like yourself seeking the same kind of, uh, 
I don't know, by claim. But you ended up with somebody who just kind of sits on that opposite polar spectrum that yeah. feeds you the energy very, that you need to be creative. Very lucky definitely is a word that accurately describes it. <laughs> so yeah, it's we've been we've been you know, we've been seeing each other a little over three years now and uh, three and a half, I think. And uh, and you know, have just it's it she's been absolutely essential, I think, to uh to to a lot of parts of my life. Uh, That's been a, a also, huge theme. Yeah, and, she really and likes conversations. And reads and reads every draft and gives me really harsh criticism that I need and it's it's really, really helpful. Her her and my brother pretty much were like the only people to actually read like alpha draft, that kind of level crap stuff. So. But your brother doesn't live in Los Angeles though. No, my brother is a research scientist. He when wow. I started the novel There you go, man. Polar opposite, right? Exactly. Yeah. So actually so he um so he really helped me out with the magic system i i love absolutely love like like many of us do on that on those subreddits you know like we can talk about brandon sanderson in terms of you know his various level various aspects of writing a novel but nobody can argue that he builds amazing worlds with amazing magic systems and when you're reading way of kings for example or mistborn which is the first one i read for him like the whole time you're reading, no matter what complaints you'll have, you, what you'll really be thinking is, man, this magic system is cool. And this world is consistent and unique and, and, and I'm, I'm jealous of that. So I tried to build, so it, like imagine a Tolkien-esque world where, you know, you have, you know, these archaic, but, you know, still, still Tolkien-esque versions of these like classic races, but their magic system is rigid and only works in like a very direct way. And so my, the magic system, although I talk about all these flighty music, whatever things, is actually very deeply rooted in, in uh, thermodynamics and like conservation of motion and that kind of a thing. So, and they have very specific, especially kind of at their, at the, at the bottom level, they have kind of very specific ways their magic works. But I think the reason that I did that is because I think most magic systems are a plot hole because they're always just a deus ex machina where mm -hmm. something, something, something in fantasy, and then we've, we're going to fix it because apparently magic can do this too. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's a problem. Like even in Avatar, which is kind of a really famous version of elementalism in a magic system. Have you, have you uh, not Avatar, the movie, have you seen the, the Last Airbender? No, I heard that the movie was horrible though. The movie is, doesn't exist. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, there is a there is a kid. Yeah, that's based on the reaction I get. I've yeah. not seen the cartoon though. No, I'm not in the anime too much. Is great, and in the the second kind of run of it also features like, uh, you know, it it deals with the LGBT rights and stuff, which is really neat. But mm -hmm. they have a really cool kind of magic system that's based on like a lot of uh, East Asian uh, martial art styles. But uh, you know, it's it's again, it's 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 really a plot hole because if you really think about if they could actually do the things that are said in in the show, then the story would be completely different. Even Name of the Wind, I think, as wonderful as that book is, um, if you really think about how that magic system works, where you can just kind of think and create a closed system and transfer mm -hmm. and transfer, you know, energy however you want to, like that would, like their world is way too similar to kind of ours. Like that, that world, that world would be crazy different. Or like Brandon mm -hmm. Sanderson says in the in the Forgotten Realms world, there is a spell that makes food the entire world would be based off of the spell that makes food. You know, mm -hmm. the, just that one spell would change literally everything because most of society is based around generating enough food for everybody to eat. So if there's a spell that makes it out of nothing, that would just be the only spell everybody does. It would just be like you would go to school to learn the food spell, you know? <laughs> so it's things like that. And so I, I think that, you know, Sanderson's kind of rigid approach to magic really helps me out. And because my brother is a scientist, he was absolutely essential in like taking apart everything that I came up for magic. Like, no, nah, that wouldn't work because if they could do this and they would do this and this would break this and that kind of a thing. So I think you can just have a very direct, very specific type of magic and it still creates this incredibly different like range of, of a world as long as you think about it in like a really rigorous and deep manner. So that's kind of my approach to like magic at this point, I would think. And my brother was a big part of that. No, it's interesting in terms of how it affects the world because, I mean, and going back to um, Name of the Wind, there was a physical element to it in terms of you had to have the resources to make the magic work. Yeah, and, and he, he kind of approaches it as like, because 
you know, even in, in the real world, right? If you're, you know, just because engineering exists doesn't mean everybody knows how to do engineering, but it's, you know, I, you know, I, there's, I, I read it long enough ago that I don't quite remember how it works. And I like that, you know, there's like, they use the lanterns and like the, you know, lanterns is like, you know, kind of the general, everyone just wants light, like sure. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I, I, I think that, uh, I, I love that magic system. So I don't want to, I don't know, disparage it at all. No, but I don't I mean, think you're disparaging it. I actually think yeah. you're you're providing an excuse for it. Um, <laughs> you know, looking for like uh, I don't know, you you have uh, the video games where you have mana and you have to wait for your right. your mana to build up. I mean, it's still resource based. Not everybody can have that resource to spend. Right, for the magic. exactly. And your think... your world, you're building up the exact same thing, where <laughs> exactly. you have a resource that people need to perform the magic. You know, yeah. fantasy as an umbrella covers science fiction. In science fiction, the technology is the magic, and and that has a resource base to it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, and I think, kind of that's that's one thing that I think the entire fantasy genre I can agree on, no matter what, is that it, moving forward magic is going to need some kind of cost um mm -hmm. because i think i think all of us are just kind of sick of the the kind of no no holds barred kind of no explanation of plot hole of just you know kind of godlike magic that can do all these things a, a good exercise i think for any fantasy writer is if you have a magic system take it take just one little aspect of it and throw it into our real world like what if we woke up today and people could just like you know manipulate fire with their mind or something like how would the world actually change if if that happened and i think the answer is always going to be way more than you would think like way way more and so you make sure that in your story uh that you're not you're not actually putting second seat to these incredible miracles that these characters can do you yeah, know what i, I mean, mean like it's important if you build it on character if you build it on plot people are going to overlook that kind of stuff because it's important to have those two elements to any story i think so and it'll make it better because i mean your entire setting should just be there to support your story and it should be essential mm -hmm. to your story and well, if I don't it seems can like be forgiven with good character and good plot because i mean if you look yeah. at what we have I don't know. Uh, you're probably a Star Wars fan, right? Oh yeah, everybody uh, is. I, I, I actually grew up a uh, my my dad's a bit of a Trekkie, so mm -hmm. I I grew up really con concentrating on Star Trek. Um, and, Same and exact didn't... thing. I mean, you got <laughs> Star Trek, you got Star Wars, but they have these magical elements to them. The, the, you know, totally. the tech in Star Trek and the magic in Star Wars, and now there are reams of literature dedicated to explaining it all away. <laughs> I was just watching, uh, yeah. watching Star Wars four. You know, whatever the enhanced version, the the one that wants, must be make, you know, wants yeah. me to kill myself basically every time I see yeah. a do back. But I mean, I mean, <laughs> you've got all these explanations for how things work that weren't there in the original trilogy. Totally, and it's, it's if not, you, it's unnecessary. It's unnecessary, but we do it, and because it's yeah. got these great characters, these this heroic journey, it's so compelling. You're soaked into it, and then you know you're okay with it. Absolutely. And if totally. you've got a character who can create food. You'll accept it if you love that character and the story that he exists in. Very Dossex, true. Dossex, Machina aside, I mean, you don't. If you have that, that's bad writing, right? <laughs> yes, it's exactly. And you, you, you will, you, you will forgive it. I think people will forgive a lot of things. And it's interesting because sometimes you have to rely on that to some extent because it's fantasy. Suspension of disbelief is important. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to just. It's it's a line like everything else, and you have to kind of just figure out how you, as a creator, want to walk it. That's really a good point. Um, so you're going to go the route of traditional publishing. Yeah, I mean, you know, gonna is in quotation marks there. But I, you know, I, I thought about it a lot about self-publishing uh, and that kind of a thing. And, um, you know, I, a big part of it for me is I feel like self-publishing is very saturated right now. Um, and it's, it just seems to be the consensus of a lot of people is it's very hard. I mean, if you, if you had tried to do it 10 years ago, we'd do one thing, but trying it now, there's just a lot of that out there. And honestly, to be, if, if we're being completely honest, you know, a musician, basically your entire life is basically self-publishing. Like you're, it's mm -hmm. putting your own music out there, quote unquote. But the fact that, uh, but when I was doing music, I never really found a genre. I was doing crazy weird stuff. Which turns out they what they love in grad school, but in this case, I'm actually doing a genre. I I I'm a fantasy person, 100% uh, through and through. It's clearly an epic fantasy, 
So I, ha I have a direct route. So I would feel like I was cheating myself if I didn't at least try to go by that direct route first. I don't really care so much. They can take a cut of my income. I, I just, you know, I, to me, it seems like, to, and they will give me access to a professional editor, you know, that kind of a thing. And to me, the traditional publishing route is a way to make my book even better than, than I think it is now. So if you want to get the best pop possible book, I can't afford to spend $6,000 or whatever on a professional editor. Yeah. This book's very long. So I, you know, for me, I, I, traditional publishing, at least to attempt that is kind of a no brainer as far as I'm concerned. There's a lot of costs associated with uh, publishing that you, know, exactly. you try to overlook. I mean, I just thought I just helped publish my novel on Amazon because, you know, screw it. I'm really <laughs> uh, I'm at the point where I think that traditional publishing isn't going to look at you unless you have millions of followers already. I mean, it I is possible. You, it's totally possible that I'll fail, but I don't see the point. Oh, I don't think you're failing. I mean, in terms <laughs> of art, you've already produced it. But I also think that you're on the right you're on the right course because you're you're multifaceted, too. I look right. at your YouTube channel. You've got a, a few thousand viewers on there, right? Yeah, You've we're got about an to audience get a thousand views. <laughs> <laughs> so close, so close. I don't know. What do you think? Should I? I can't decide. Should, I mean, is that the kind of you can't? You only really mention that in a cover letter. It doesn't have anything to do with, you know, with with my novel. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm going to release some of my music from the novel on that channel. But it's like, I don't know. Like, I don't think I can say. There's nowhere in a cover letter to be like. Also, I have. 100,000 views on YouTube, does that count for anything? You know, it's I think just... it does because you have, I don't know, do you know a person, uh, she's a YouTuber, she's the only used to YouTuber really I know, uh, her name is Grace Heldig. Oh, uh, she's uh, she's a singer, right? No, no, she's just a comedian. Or com um, basically, she just does 10-minute uh, um, videos on YouTube. She has millions and millions and millions of followers, and she's got a, a New York Times bestselling book. Awesome. No, I it's a horrible, I horrible that. book. It's basically autobiographical. It's unreadable <laughs> completely, but she has made millions of dollars off the sure. fact that she makes 10 minute videos. Nice. <laughs> but then you have somebody like you who spent, you know, two years, two and a half years writing a novel. She spent a weekend writing something that has gained her. Right. What we would consider a lifetime's worth of effort. Totally. And, you know, it's in, in some ways it's unfair, but I just, you know, I, and it's it's definitely relevant to today's market. And in the end, honestly, I just I think that the fantasy world is still a little higher quality. I think that people, an agent who represents fantasy, has already kind of, you know, cursed themselves. I think because it's it's, <laughs> it's one of the right, yeah. it's one of yeah. the least read led subject matters. Is it, is it? Now, although I mean, it's like I don't know, of, man. Of What's the major the... genres. I mean, it's it's coming up. It's definitely becoming much more popular every year and i think that that's why it's important for us to be working really hard at this now because it's already starting to become a little you know uh people are starting to gun for it They're, they can see the zeitgeist but I, I think also like just you know uh, representing fantasy the the number of agencies that do that i mean my full list and i looked for literally every agency that i could find and i know that i missed some and there's more out there but i only have about 80 agencies total which doesn't, which seems like a lot, but I think compared to how many agencies there are in general, like that, that's actually a pretty small, like they, those agents all know each other and, uh, you know, and they, they just really love fantasy, you know, and they want to read the book. So I actually think that it's like a double edged sword to use a fantasy uh, <laughs> uh, simile, but it's, you know, it's like a, uh, I think these agents really care and they really want to read and get a good fantasy novel out there because, you know, it's like, you're, no one's expecting to get the next game of Thrones. They're, no, you know, no one's, and then they don't, they know for a fact, they're not going to get the next eat, pray, love. Right. So it's like, they just want to put fantasy out. So I really think that and on a human level, a lot of these agents just really want to read a book and get a good book out there. So that's what I, at least what I tell myself <laughs> when I'm dreading query. Are you, uh, are night, you basing you know? that off of anything? Yeah. So, I mean, I've been doing an incredible amount of research and I've, and I went to, I've done, I've gone to a couple of cons now too, and spoken with not agents directly, but uh, authors and editors and those kind of things who work with it. And I think the one thing that really kind of comes across the board and some, like some, some of them are just these, you know, scam artists, but and for the most part, I think the one thing that comes across is just really loving the genre. And I, I really do think that, I mean, I, I, I'm totally biased about it, but I really think, and I truly believe this, that people that read and love and enjoy fantasy are just 
it, it's it's a it's a little bit of a different type of person and it's a person with an incredibly active imagination and it's very difficult to to have that kind of imagination without um without having passion and, and empathy too and so i've like look at all these all these agents who just they tweet constantly and are like always talking about you know they're, how they're excited about it. like if you read the stuff by by sanderson's agent for example at jabberwocky uh he just he, he just loves sanderson stuff he's like i love this book oh yeah look at look at the the blurb on the back oh it's so cool like it how neat is this sword you know stuff like that like they just geek out about it like the rest of us so i think what, what you're looking for is an is a, an agent that's a geek like you and uh and they'll get excited about the same things that you do you know that, that's my hope at least now hope spring is eternal right yeah, I just don't. You know, and the, <laughs> what it really boils down to is, I I don't want to be a self defeater. If if it turns out I'm wrong and no one will care, the the worst thing that happens is I waste four months querying a bunch of agents and they all reject me. And then now I know, but do I don't do? know, so I may as well try. What do you do at that point? Let's oh, say, yeah. I, let's I say, that, I mean, we could go. We could take this conversation in two routes. We could say you publish, right, mm -hmm. with a an agent. You get an agent. He publishes you. It gets uh, bought by a film company, and you get to write your next book, and you're already famous. Hmm. But let's say you're four months down the road. You've queried every single one of those agents. Half of them responded with their, you know, form letter, and the other half completely ignored you. What's your step? Oh, I mean, I, I'm I'm honestly planning for that, and anything else will be a miracle. But uh, if right, I mean, you, you have, still fantasize, but I mean, what's yeah, your what's your next step at that point? At that point, you have two options. I mean, every agent. Um, you know, if literally none of them are like rewrite and resend, then I mean, I can still rewrite and resend to a different agent, like after like six months or whatever their refresh period is, uh, or I can self-publish. And I am I'm stealing myself mentally that if I get no responses, then um, then I'll probably probably uh, go the the self-publish route at that point. Maybe after like six months of querying, total failure no no indication that even rewriting would be worth it and then yeah uh, i'll do another pass probably uh, or hire an editor just what i can afford and then self-publish and you know you know if you have a bunch of youtube followers and you have a bunch of reddit friends and etc cetera, etc cetera, you can you can imagine starting to to get at least a couple a little bit of money from self-publishing um i i i to me, that seems more bleak than querying, so that's why I'm querying first. <laughs> oh, it's real bleak, man. It really is. The whole the whole industry right now is bleak. I mean, nobody seems to be making money. Even the traditional publishers aren't making money. And my thing is you can find every piece of content out there for free, except for the people who are independent, independently sell, you know, selling <laughs> the novels on Amazon. You can't yeah. find that stuff. For sure. So I, you know, I my my solution to that is I think that people are sick of a lot of the things we've talked about. People are tired of Eurocentrism. They're tired of plot holes and Deus Ex Machina. Um, and, you know, they're tired of just a bunch of straight white males saving, you know, the damsel in distress. So I tried to write a book that took everything I just said and completely turned it on its head and made it different and new. And I wanted to write a book that I think people I think My we're kind of... saying the same thing. What you're saying is you <laughs> need to find an audience and you need to specifically aim your fiction at them. 100%. And what, man. <laughs> and what you're aiming at is people who are a, um, they feel like they're outcasted from society. Exactly. Because... Exactly. I, ho I to wholeheartedly agree. Uh, it's fascinating because that's what you have too. Even the, the major broadcast stations on television are, are kind of diversifying like that as well yeah it's interesting i mean hey get out is is it came out man like there's there's good movies out there and they're just and they're not oh yeah get out i've been looking for that one it's good oh, right it's, it's awesome man it's such a good movie jordan peele definitely knows what he's doing uh and it, you know it's just it's across the board you know there's people people with uh you know lgbt and trans characters and a lot of leads who are not white or you know in you know uh, romantic stories where the, not both characters aren't white it, they're just trying to get that you know because i think that you can't just default market to you know to, to pale face people anymore and 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 just know that you'll be successful because of that i think the world is diversifying no, and, that's very good that's you know, a you really good about, place to look at 
Yeah, and you and you can talk about why, and that would be kind of like a philosophical thing almost. But I mean, the the reality because people is people self-identify. I mean, I, I obviously have a why. You you have somebody; they have a definition of self, and that self is what they want to continue to define. Yeah, and if I you agree can provide a book for that, then that's awesome. Right, and you know, it's just the the world's changing, and I think that every time someone says, "Well, this industry is is just." It's just heck right now. I think, <laughs> you know, with what they're really saying is people want something new and different. So um, it's a good thing. The fact that people are looking for that is good. And it means that it's becoming popular enough that more than just neckbeards, you know, who are like 12 years old in their basement <laughs> playing D&D, &D, like me. And yes I, did, yes, I did have a neckbeard at 12 years old. So that's, that is actually not that was, that was a autobiographical aside. No, I understand. I, I'm jealous, though, man. I was not playing D&D at 12 years old. I would have loved to, but I was my not. Friend, my friend Don Weil, he got me into fantasy, and his brothers, uh, he, or one of his brother at least, uh, was a DM. So I played a couple sessions there, changed my life. Oh, man, you got to say, though, that's where that magic is kind of, eh, you know what? You have magic. Go ahead and use it. There's no repercussions. Go ahead and kill some orcs and goblins. They have magic, too. <laughs> Oh, I they read all books have like treasure. that for sure. I just I didn't want to write a book. All like right. That. <laughs> I actually, to be completely I mean, honest, uh, I uh, I was playing a D and D campaign when I very first started conceptualizing this book, and two of the characters were based on characters that I was playing. Um, any campaign, uh, the the names at least are consistent. Um, the characters ended up being quite different, but you know. What is that it, called? Is that really low fantasy or is that high fantasy? I can never tell the difference. The D and T type. Uh... High fantasy? I think it's high Is fantasy. It? I'm really I bad. High at this, fantasy though. was like the you kings should... and the knights and the. So I, apparently, yeah, I keep on hearing different definitions of high fantasy like in my head the, the closer it is to conan the barbarian the more it's high fantasy <laughs> but that that's really like all i know like i think because i think dnd you can do both like you can do a low fantasy campaign i think uh, you know i just i don't know <laughs> the, I, the, I don't know the answer i know what epic fantasy is high fantasy versus low fantasy is still amorphous to me another example of write what you love yeah. Don't worry about it. I mean, honestly. <laughs> exactly. The genre question, I think it spans all types of, you know, artistic uh, endeavors. So it's just, you, you want to you wanna look at it to the extent that you can and the parts you don't understand don't matter because <laughs> you're going you're gonna to create your story regardless of what, what wedge it fits into, you know? Yeah, it's exactly a great point. You're going to create your story because it's your story and hopefully you resonate with the people out there. Right, exactly. Develop and I an think, audience. Yeah, and all you really have to do is know where you're coming from. So, like, if you had never read a fantasy book and sat down to write a fantasy novel, I mean, you're almost, I mean, nothing's ever guaranteed, but I mean, I think mm -hmm. we can be fairly certain that would be a failure because, you know, you wouldn't know where you're coming from. For, for people who grew up reading fantasy, you know, it's, it's, it's much easier to, that your personal story is going to be from a place that the rest of the world wants to read because mm -hmm. you know you're kind of on the same page as your reader you've been writing that since you were a kid no pun intended <laughs> uh, yeah absolutely um in terms of uh man my thought where did it go somebody Damn. stole it Damn those <laughs> I was getting away from gone it. completely what was i going to tell you and now it's completely disappeared but anyway in terms of your i know what a short fiction where are you in terms of short fiction uh, I've written a bunch of short stories personally, but I, uh, and I, I, uh, I've, I actually haven't ever written a fantasy short story. I've never done that. Not really. I, 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 I submitted a couple to the fantasy writers contest and I, I mm -hmm. won a couple of them too. Oh, did you um, really? Yeah. One of them though, one of them was the, the shanty song, which is a song. And then the other one was more like a slice of life thing it was like a flash fiction deal so it still wasn't a complete story like i've never done but i've written sci-fi shorts i've written i've written a bunch of sci-fi shorts actually sci-fi shorts and various things especially when i was younger kind of more as practice um and i love i love reading short stories like philip k dick is like my bread and butter i'll read his short stories until the end of time ray bradbury um and asimov all those kind of things I just something about sci-fi short stories really, really works for me. So, strangely enough, I I I write epic fantasy novels and and sci-fi short stories. I I don't know why. <laughs> you should try your hand at writing more. Publish them on your blog, then. Just get your stuff out there. 
Yeah, for sure. Can. For sure. I, you know, I, I one of the things I have an idea for actually kind of like a, a combo sci-fi fantasy short that is actually like a cohesive story. Um, and that's one of the things I might do um, when I truly take a break from editing this novel is I might write that. And I, I, uh, I have a list of a couple of online magazines that I want to submit it to. Um, so that's definitely on the radar too. I, I totally agree with that. So this has Most been a, an amazing conversation. I've really enjoyed talking with you. Um, have we missed anything? And do you want to add anything to the, um, to what we talked about already? No, this has been great, man. I, 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 I really enjoyed it too. Absolutely. It's so cool what you're doing with the, and uh, I, I hope you continued success in, in your podcasting. Well, success, I don't know what a success is. I'm, I'm so, <laughs> my success, honestly, is being able to sit across the table from people like you. Because yeah. what, we've got 3,000 miles between us. You know, we're both trolls in our basement writing novels. And yep. normally, we wouldn't be able to talk to each other. But here we are. We're engaging and giving each other ideas and cheering each other on. And oh, exactly, that, man. that's what exactly. I want. I want Wait. me, you, Jason, and Dylan, and Elizabeth to all sit in the same room and just, you know, bullshit about what we love. And that's just writing <laughs> words. Exactly. It's so wonderful. Like, the communities, the supportive writing communities online are, are such a new thing. And they're so essential to my process. I have, you know, my book is infinitely better because I had access, you know, to people like you and, 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 you know, agent query and absolute right and subreddits and all that. It's just, it's a totally, yeah. totally collaborative worldwide collaborative process now writing a book. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's just man. wonderful. I totally fantasy, uh, fantasy writers, uh, the subreddit that we, you know, I met you through. Yeah. I had never written a fantasy short story in my life until I wrote the, uh, the Neanderthal piece from nice. like four or five months ago. <laughs> like that's my first fantasy piece. I came from a traditional, you know, literary background where I got my degree in creative writing or whatnot. You know, I write about you know, humanity. You know, I just decided, you know, I want to write some fantasy. I want to try some genre. And even for someone like you, I mean, because, I mean, you, you have that kind of drive and think of all the resources of where should I start? What should I read? What's good? What's not? And you can read that and decide what you agree and don't agree with and, and talk about it. And trust me, if you go on that and be like, if you read Way of Kings and hate it, you can go on the subreddit and be like, I hated Way of Kings. And people can be like, oh man, I did too. I'm so glad you said that. And blah, blah, blah. You know, there's so many, there's so many diverse opinions. And regardless of how strong we disagree, we're still supporting each other. And I think that's really important. Yeah, Reddit's the future, man. I don't know whether or not the future's already here, but it's uh, in terms of finding <laughs> community, finding people that share your voice, getting your opinions just aired out and find out whether or not you're thinking in the right way. It just seems to be a great place to go. Yeah, I think optimism is really important, and I think that the world is a very scary place no matter what era you were born in, but I have a lot of hope because of things like Reddit and people who can connect and help each other out and spread information regardless of, uh, of their background, and I think it's, I think it's just, it, in the end, as long as we don't, you know, burn in a, bi in a fiery ball of earth, scorched earth, then I really think things are, things are just always getting better in, in a global sense, and I, I have a lot of hope. For, for no, one of the things that flavors my uh, my fiction is that death is inevitable. Unfortunately, all we have is the moment that we currently are living in. Yeah, <laughs> and, absolutely. And we have to use it. You know, we just have to use it. We have to find a way not to to mold um, and rot. We have to find a way to be vibrant. And mm -hmm. and one of the ways that we've decided in an overpopulated world is to make art. And there's nothing wrong with that. Exactly. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, so let's see. You have a website, paulmathis.com. There's bunches of videos on there. You've got some writing on there. Put some more writing yeah. up, man. It was beautiful talking to you. I really want to read some of your stuff. I hope to see your name, well, your username on um, some fantasy contests going forward. <laughs> hey, man. I look forward to reading your stuff, too. Thanks yeah, so right. much Excellent. for doing this. Yeah, no problem, man. We'll talk again. Take care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. And that was Mr. Mathis. Uh, like I said, he's an interesting guy. He's got some good opinions. And uh, you can check out his, uh, his contact stuff in the show notes. Highly recommend you do so. His uh, YouTube page is filled with music. And <laughs> it's worth it. I promise you. Um, again, follow me on Twitter at... Bry, a yellow uh, destination right 
www.wordpress.com. That's a good place to check out my writing. Eventually, it will be brianandyellow.com. I'm getting motivated to do that, I promise. Um, this will be a podcast. It was at one point. It will be again. Um, hmm. I think that's just about it for today. Um, we are going to have another podcast later on this week. And I believe that is going to be with Tracy Lindemann. She is a musical journalist up in Montreal. Um, there's an interesting conversation with her where she discusses her roots in punk music and, and what has uh, motivated her to pursue a career in, in music and reporting on bands. Um, all right, well, that's it for me today, and thanks for listening. I'll talk to you again soon. Bye bye.